everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, and thank you, Richard. Um, so just to start off, can you tell us a little bit about why Amgen was interested in developing biosimilars in the first place? Sure. Thanks, Carla. That's, that's a great place to start. Um, Amgen is inherently and known as an innovative company, so it may not be obvious to people why Amgen would get into biosimilars. But really, it's because we understood the complexity of manufacturing and developing biologics. And for us, we're focused on the more complex monoclonal antibodies, which we understand also the complexity of that. We have the scientists and the capabilities uh, to develop high-quality biologics. And importantly, the role that biosimilars can play for patients is in increased access. So the goal of biosimilars is to have more choices for patients and physicians, increased access uh, for the patients, and it helps us serve the patients that way. And importantly, it can lower the costs for healthcare to create some headroom in the payer system so that the healthcare, industry, healthcare system can then also support the new innovations that are also being created. Great, and picking up off of that regulatory discussion that we just mm -hmm. heard, um, can you tell us a little bit about your beliefs around the data package that's required to demonstrate biosimilarity? Um, how do you feel about those requirements? So the requirements by the FDA and even the EMA in Europe, uh, I think they're very thoughtful and appropriate. I think the agency's goal is uh, public safety as well as public health, uh, and that's what they're ensuring. So they've been very thoughtful and scientific to ensure that these products are truly highly similar with no clinically meaningful difference, and that's really what we need for patient confidence and physician confidence. And Ensuring high-quality products in this fashion, I think, lead to the near-term, but importantly for biosimilars, the long-term success as well, to ensure that nothing goes wrong, that patients and physicians have confidence and trust in these products and can truly use them uh, as a, a, an equal choice when they're uh, treating their patients. Mm -hmm. And can you take us a little bit through the development process? What does it take to develop a biosimilar? Sure. So the development of a biosimilar is is a bit different or unique than an innovative product or an innovative uh, molecule. It starts with understanding the reference product. So we first have to acquire the reference product um, in the commercial space, in the market, and analyze it. So analyzing it, we use all the current technology. But importantly, we also have to create sensitive assays to really understand that product, to understand the structure and the function, and importantly, what parts of the structure really drive its activity. Once we understand that, we have to create a cell system to make the product. So that's the unique aspect maybe about biologics that maybe not everyone understands, is these products are actually created and manufactured in living cell systems. So each manufacturer has to create a cell system for their product that has the same amino acid sequence as the reference product. And importantly, that the cell system will put the antibody, uh, for considering antibodies, put the product together in the right fashion, have the right structure, and post-translational changes, would it put sugars onto the structure or what it might do to the structure to still have a product at the end that is highly similar to the reference product. Once we have a product that we think is highly similar, we then have to still show that we have equivalent exposure, uh, meaning pharmacokinetics, as the reference product. So it's important to have the same activity, the same exposure for the patients, uh, and then finally, and maybe equally or more important, is no clinically meaningful differences. Uh, as the other threshold or standard. And so we do that with a, what's a patient trial generally uh, to have an equivalence efficacy endpoint and show equivalent efficacy and also compare safety and, importantly, immunogenicity. These are all large molecules. They're foreign to the patient's body, so they can be seen as a foreign protein, and we want to make sure that they're not invoking the immune system in a negative manner. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit on some of the aspects of biosimilar development that are really unique to biosimilar development. Yes, yeah, so the unique part in development compared to an innovative development program, probably most important for the patients and as well as the uh, physicians is to understand the data that will come and is created for them as opposed to the regulatory agency. And I think a lot of focus is on the clinical data. Everyone wants clinical data to ensure that there's no clinically meaningful difference. And there, the study designs are different than an innovator program. And so in an innovator program in oncology, we often will look at survival or progression-free survival or some sort of clinical outcome like that to prove the value of the innovative medicine, to understand its 
benefits and its risks. So the innovator program has to focus on its risks and benefits. The biosimilar program focuses on no meaningful differences. So we will study a sensitive population to detect a difference if there is one. And importantly, the endpoints will be different. And this is an area that we continue to try to educate, particularly the physicians, that the study designs will be different and the endpoints are likely different, particularly in the oncology setting, where we might look at tumor response instead of survival. And if you have a highly similar product with equivalent exposure, and then you also have the same tumor response, you have confidence at that point that you'll have the same clinical benefits long-term, such as survival. So that's probably the biggest difference is the endpoint and the study design. Sure, and um, when we talk about extrapolation, um, what does it mean to talk about extrapolation in the context of biosimilar development? Yeah, extrapolation is a key part of biosimilars for success for development as to why we can develop these products at, a, at overall a lower cost and hence provide them still broadly to patients. So extrapolation for biosimilars is really taking the knowledge of the reference product and applying it to the biosimilar product. That's different than the innovator space where it's usually a, an extrapolation of one population to a similar population. So it'd be uh, easy it's from an adult disease to the same disease in a pediatric, for example. That would be the classic extrapolation. For biosimilars, it's you, if you have a high quality, highly similar product, again, with no clinically meaningful difference, if you understand the mechanism of action of the different uses, and we understand the aspect of the two products similarity, then you can apply that knowledge of the reference product to the biosimilar so that it too can be used across those same uses as the reference product, and it can be used with the same high confidence. And so obviously when we talk about biosimilars, interchangeability with the reference product is one of the biggest things that we're thinking about. Um, what is your take on interchangeability um, within oncology when it comes to biosimilars? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because there's a lot to talk about interchangeability these days. And so just to make sure we're level set on what that means, in the United States, the concept of interchangeability really means that a, if it's approved as an interchangeable, that the product can be substituted in a pharmacy for the reference product uh, without the physician knowing. And I think that's important for some cases, but in oncology, it's probably not that relevant. I don't think most biologics are not distributed through a retail pharmacy. Patients don't go to the corner pharmacy to get their oncology biologic. So in reality, for in oncology, I don't think interchangeability is really meaningful. Uh, what's meaningful is having high quality biosimilars that people can trust and have confidence in and have the competition to increase access and provide that uh, headspace or headroom for the healthcare system. Um, and lastly, an argument you'll hear sometimes from branded drug makers against biosimilars is that you know biosimilars will result in fewer sales for them, which means less money to funnel into their R&D and less money for innovative products. Um, I'm interested in your perspective, um, you know, with Amgen being a developer of both biosimilars and branded products, what is your take on that argument? Well, I, I could really only speak for Amgen, and so our view, and again, a part of why we uh, went into biosimilars as well, it's a, it's a relatively small investment from Amgen's point of view. Uh, we're still focused on innovation. Uh, but key for us is uh, providing that access, but also that headspace uh, in the payer system, the healthcare system, so that the healthcare system can actually support the innovative drugs that we're producing. Uh, and, and secondly, actually, the revenue from the biosimilars at Amgen, at least, uh, can funnel back into R&D. So we, we use the, we'll use the revenues from our biosimilars uh, to again funnel into the R&D engine at Amgen to help create new innovative medicines as well. Great. Um, well, thank you everybody for listening. I hope you'll join me in thanking Richard for a great discussion this well, morning. Thanks for a few minutes.